pretty much the entire group started always saying that they were Canadian. <laughs> there was a lot of people in the group who were just like, whoa, I'm just going to be Canadian. This is an easy cop out. <laughs> I, I felt so uneasy one time when I said I was from Canada. I could not do it anymore. So the entire time I essentially, you know, I, you know, I'd be in a group of people and they're like, oh, we're from Canada. The next minute somebody asked me, oh, where are you from? I'm from the United States. They're like, but he's from Canada. I'm like, okay. So it got a little complicated. <laughs> but I always wanted to know their reaction because it was important to me that they knew I was from the United States, that they knew that I was informed about their country, that I wanted to be even more informed about their country, and that they should talk to me. So there's a lot of different impressions that I can say. So, you know, I have these pictures that are, you know, us being tourists. Because in some level, it's really difficult no matter how informed you are, if you're going into a country, you're in some level getting a very superficial look. It's difficult to get into the social structure and really, you know, interact with people. And so even if we're coming in as students, it's so hard to try and break out of that tourist mode. It's so easy to just look at this beautiful reconstructed area. You see there's the capital going over there, and they've done massive reconstruction work in Olaana because that's where a lot of tourists are going to be living, staying. They're creating new hotels so that people can stay there. And they're, you know, they're putting some paint on it. They're making it nice and pretty. They're creating that colonial charm. But you kind of have to tear away from it and look a little deeper. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> while they want you to go to the resorts, like in Veradero, stay there, look at the pretty beaches, and leave and think that the c country is gorgeous. You still have to kind of force yourself to, despite any form of culture shock you might receive, tear away and try and be a little bit more mindful about what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I always wanted people to know I was from the United States. And so there were, there's about three different responses. So one, <laughs> we had people follow us because they're like, dude, these guys are from the US, let's take pictures of them. That happened. I was on the, we were on the Malikon coming out late at night. We were just chatting with people, walking back from a place. Everyone, there's, it's the seaside corridor that was created while the U.S. were still pretty much in control of Cuba. The U.S. created it. And it's still there, and that's where everybody gathers. But a lot of people were like, oh, American. Mm. We're, we're our own tourist attractions, essentially, in their own country. Um, so there, there was that. There were people who, you know, thought that we had a lot of money and were essentially able to give it to them. Um, that was more experienced by Monica. And then there were the professors, anybody who spoke to us, they were so happy to see us. You know, I, I think Randy might be able to agree. They pretty much all across the board, you know, there's so much financial opportunity for the country when it comes to what companies might be able to grow and foster there, what joint investments. I think they were really big on joint investment. They wanted liquid capital coming into the country to be able to help their, you know, companies flourish. That was one of the main things. So they saw a lot of opportunity, and they loved to see us. So really, you know, I didn't see negativity. That's actually something I'm going to point out, because a lot of things, when I told people I was going to Cuba, they would say, oh, wait, aren't they mad at us because of history? It, it's kind of in the past a little bit. I, I think it's more the United States that mindset-wise, we're remaining in the past. We're still in the 60s. We're still in Bay of Pigs. We're still all the way in the Cold War. But they've moved on. 80% of the population of Cuba today was born after the revolution. They know the revolution, and they know their current state, and they don't really care about what's happening with the United States. They have their lives, and they're focusing on that. So when it comes to Americans going there, I think there you know, should be a little bit less fear and more openness on our part, just being like sharing and not being fearful ourselves. Um, and you know, our own country as well maybe should start thinking about maybe taking in that same mindset. Yeah, actually unlike Aaron, I didn't always say I was American. Sometimes I would say I was Brazilian. Um, <laughs> guilty. Um, and I guess part of the reason why I did that was because when I travel, I really, I, I'm sometimes nervous that if I say I'm American, the person automatically won't want to talk to me because there's, I don't know, you just feel like there's this barrier. And even sitting in the tour bus, um, I kind of felt like, I don't know, it was just very in your face, the economic disparity between you and the Cubans. 
Uh, you're, look, you're sitting in your nice tour bus and then you're looking down at the city bus making eye contact with someone where the bus is just completely filled with people and you're like, this is awkward, you know? And so you try to do as much as you can to try and reach the, the level of the Cubans and like engage in conversation, but sometimes it was difficult just because you, um, some Cubans did try to get money. Um, like I unfortunately did have one of those experiences, but if you take into context the situation that some Cubans are living, um, they do what they can to survive, and life, daily life can be very difficult depending on where you're living or what your job is. Uh, and so it's, it's not as simple. And I gotta say I'm really grateful to actually just have heard Aaron's specific takeaway from that perspective, because sometimes I struggle with that when I'm in a country and it's just very obvious that I have a lot of privilege just coming from where, I, where I'm coming from. It, it's hard for me not to feel bad and, and get overwhelmed by that. But, Definitely it's clear that there is an openness and there's an eagerness of cultural in exchange of ideas and culture um, and trying to understand each other. Um, anyway, so here we're moving on to the monetary impact of the revolution. So one thing that's really clear in Cuba is that 1959 is forever real. It kind of seems like it was the birth of Christ because it's just <laughs> it's everywhere and it feels like that was the beginning of time and it's very in your face. Um, and ways you see that economically um, would be, for example, the State Mall. Uh, I didn't get a lot of good pictures of the State Mall because the lighting wasn't good, but um, I never really thought what a State Mall would look like, and most of the stores didn't have a specific name. It was ma mostly named by categories, and then underneath each um, categor categorical store would say uh, La Casa de la Familia Cubana, so like the, the house of the Cuban family. So it's, everything's just kind of like on the same level, I guess, and there isn't really much of an idea of consumerism. Um, partly due that it's more of a socialist state, but also there really isn't an economy to have a lot of consumerism in Cuba. Um, but that was something I never really thought about, because when growing up when you hear about social, when you learn about socialism or um, uh, when you learn about communism, in the United States, you just think of the color red and you, you think evil. And you just kind of like, I, what, why? <laughs> or I don't know, I don't even know what that looks like. So it was, it was really good, I guess, to, to see what that looks like and determine for myself what exactly that means. Um, and despite economic hardships, Cubans are actually very innovative. Um, this is a picture of a truck. And inside the truck here, you can't see, but there's like two bus seats on either side. So during the special period in the 90s when Cuba was completely isolated and no longer dependent on the Soviet Union as a source of income, they had to, they were completely had to rely on themselves and pretty much start over. And one of the ways they addressed public transportation was take trucks and make them into buses. You saw this, uh, Yanni, our tour guide, mentioned that this is more prevalent in the countryside, not so much in the city. But when you have a population in which like 80% use public transportation and you need city buses and you can't import them or you don't have money to get another bus, you definitely need to be creative. And it's really clear that Cubans are very independent and able to think on their feet. Okay, so I, these are BC taxis. This is probably another innovation that's happened. So it's buses and you can see well it's people on a bicycle with two seats right behind it for some strange reason they always put like broadcasting on the back i think it's their own personal stickers but there was like a brazilian flag or a canadian flag at some point that i've seen um there or they paint the back of it each each chair is the um, cuban flag but so these bc taxis maybe it's just you and another person that's maybe like two kook which is equivalent <coughs> to 2.5 dollars um and so a lot of people end up working in the service industry because with a you know an actual job you get 450 coup which is about twenty dollars a week um a month. Oh, uh, sorry a month if it was a week they might be doing a little better um but um what we were told is generally um you know that if you just have a state job and you're doing that that'll last you about four days if you're ignoring rations completely um so a lot of people do service and so I ended up having a nice little fun conversation with the BC taxi driver one time um, where we were riding around and he's showing me places. You know, he's just like, oh, this is this, this is this. So it's like, the, here's the Teatro um, Marti. And the specific phrase he used is that Fidel reclaimed it for us. So there was a lot of pride that Fidel took it for us. It is ours again. He was saying that it was essentially run and controlled by people outside of Cuba, and now it's ours. 
And I was just like, oh, and they just did a bunch of reconstruction inside because we had a presentation on old uh, on a reconstruction. So I was like, oh, I'm going to show my knowledge. And he was like, oh, yeah, now it's gorgeous. Like, you know, it's so Cuban, like it's ours. Um, and then right after it, I, I love the juxtaposition. You know, we were talking about, you know, income and whatnot. And he said that you can't actually trust the government to be able to help you. We, so he was a trained veterinarian. He had gone to college. He was a veterinarian. But he worked as a BC taxi driver because working in service was actually earning him a lot more money. And that's something that we heard from other people as well, including our tour guide, mm -hmm. where you know, you can be a doctor, but if it doesn't have those extra benefits on the side, you know, maybe you don't have the money without other people's support to get by. Yeah, and I, and I think what really shocked me the most is that a lot of Cubans were saying, like, I, I did this for myself. In terms of, like, economic gain or, like, being able to live the daily grind, they attributed that more to their own efforts rather than the government's, which is something I definitely I did not expect that. Yeah, so... Um, Here's the cars. Everybody's probably heard about the Cuban cars. They're essentially all from the 1950s. They're gorgeous. They're repainted. They've been passed down through the generations. They don't have the money, the money on hand to be able to purchase new cars. So they, you know, remodel these vehicles to be able to make them work for today. And a lot of them now um, are either, you know, family cars or they're working as taxis. Um, so I know a lot of people are just like, yes, let's go, you know, into one of these nice old cars and have a taxi ride. So that was another way for people to make money off of something passed down. Mm -hmm. uh, so so <clears throat> this isn't exactly a representative <coughs> picture of a family home. This is, is it, um, Randy, is it Solares? Um, where essentially it's a large complex that might be having eight families in total in one building such as this. Um, and, you know, we, there was a lot of issue where you know, the housing's limited. And so once again, this is something that's passed down, where where you live um, is passed down. So if a family had an apartment or a home at the beginning of the revolution, you know, they might still be living there and they might be renovating it. They might be adding walls. Um, in one of the books, um, Al Havana, um, up here, that was kind of exp um, shown and talked about in that what they did to find space. So you have this room. Imagine you have a drop-down ceiling that you can, that's a crawl space where you can just put beds. So that might be one of those innovations where they put a ladder and they're able to get up there and sleep in this area but still have the open area to be able to walk and live in downstairs. So another thing is they might create curtains. Um, a family, if a couple's married, they move into whosoever's parents' home is the largest. And then if a kid is born, they put another curtain up or they create another wall and they separate the place so that they can create a room for the kid. So this is something how all of these families end up living in one apartment, and over time, it's just, you know, create really small area. Yeah. I, I mean, sure. <laughs> so um, this is as we were exiting one <laughs> of the um, um, Paradars. So this those are the chocolate where it was filmed. Yeah, so this is actually um, where the, um, the movie Fresas y Chocolate was filmed. We ate at that paladar. Um, I don't remember the name of it to you, either of you? Fancy. Randy's on it. <laughs> um, and as the, the bottom floor, so it's on the third floor, and the entire area, as you're going up the stairs, you actually think that it's not inhabited, but actually the first and second floor were apartments. And you know, had, you had this cracked marble, and this used to be a, a very rich family's place, and it would be turned into apartments. And the lobby area was kind of, you know, le left to be. But on the first floor, as you're coming down the stairs, you know, this was written on the wall. Um, and I just kind of wanted this to be in here because um, Ratio o Muerte was everywhere, mm -hmm. um, along with like la, um, la Revolución is invincible. And the revolution is invincible. Um, so there's all of these posters, all of these things, where even when we were at the um, sugar factory, I believe, was probably where we saw the largest amount of extra propaganda. Yeah, and just. I have a theory, I'm not sure if it's <laughs> right, but um, Che Guevara, during, right after the revolution occurred, he did what was called motivational... Uh, well, moral motivation. Thank you, moral motivation in terms of paying 
uh, in order to pay Cubans. So instead of receiving a monetary salary, they would receive rewards. Um, maybe like a politician eats with you at your, like at your family's house or something like that. Eventually figured out that people needed money in order to be motivated to work. But um, this is at a sugar factory, and it kind of it has that idea that like you need to work, you know. And I just kind of wonder if it's from that time period when he had the moral motivation. Um, and then not only so the the, the poem is kind of like the essence of the ideology of the revolution that you live for your country, that you fight for the revolution, that you maintain the respect and nationalism of the Cuban government and the and the Castro um, regime. And we actually had an opportunity to visit, visit a ration store, but it wasn't explicitly put in our itinerary, because you can't really tell the Cuban government, oh, hey, by the way, we're going to go see a ration store. I hope that's OK. So Because <laughs> it's not OK. <laughs> they wouldn't let you. So instead, it was under discretionary learning. Wait, wait. And um, we, I, I thought it was incredible that Yanni actually, like, showed us, like she showed us physically how much food a Cuban family gets every month. I mean, that's very risky for her. Um, and just being very open and talking about it, she even showed us her ration book. Um, and was just very open with sharing uh, her life with us, which I, I respect that a lot. Um, and here's another picture of the ration store. There's a lot of propaganda just everywhere in the store. Um, hanging flags, posters. Um, just very clear that they want to communicate the idea that the revolution is essential. Uh, this poster, or I guess flyer, uh, we saw it at the University of Havana, and I took a picture of it after one of our lectures. And um, it's for the Movimiento Todos Somos 70, so like we are 70, and it's in commemoration of the 70th anniversary of Fidel enrolling into the University of Havana. So it's not even like um, Fidel's birthday, but it's like celebrating him being a university student, which is fascinating. Like, I just, I think I was really blown away by the nationalism you see. Um, here you see Bank de Julio, so the day of the revolution, just everywhere, um, you know, murals on the, on the road, and, or not on the road, but on the walls. Uh, this was at the Hotel Nacional, and again, 1959, and Fidel and his, and his um, fatigue. customary, yeah. what's it called? Military fatigue. Thank you. Um, if you see Fidel, most likely he is dressed as he was during the revolution. You don't see as many pictures of him as older. So it's just that constant image of Fidel as like the strong writer for the nation. And it says 1959 um, below that painting. Here at the stadium, you have Fidel, again, in the same outfit, playing baseball. Um, national Cuban sports, so of course. Um, and then here at the top of this building, I don't remember if this is part of Revolutionary Square where they have like the big portraits of the three revolutionaries, um, uh, Camino Cienfuegos, Che Guevara, and Fidel like, on the buildings. But here it says, Hasta la victoria siempre. And this is, uh, this is referencing a song that was written in honor of Che Guevara, um, part of the Nueva Trova movement, which is similar to Nueva Canción of Latin America, but instead of um, the music of Nueva Trova acting out against the regime, it was in complete support. So this song was basically praising Che Guevara for everything he had sacrificed for Cuba. Um, so it was just very interesting to see all the propaganda. I, that was one thing I didn't really expect. And when talking to Cubans about what they think of politics, uh, we had a heart to heart with Yanni, our tour guide. And we were asking her, I don't know, you kind of felt uncomfortable asking questions like, so is there like a dissent or something like that? Because you don't know if that's putting the person in danger, you don't know if they would actually, I don't know, hard to explain um, why there is tension there. But uh, she would say things like Cubans don't care about politics, or she'd say um, that even if you were to replace the Castros, nothing would change. It would still be the same sort of political ideology, which was interesting. Um, and I guess I was overall uh, surprised to hear her say that she felt that she did everything herself to get her to where she was. Because you think like the ideology of communism or like the ideology of the government is that the government is going to get you there. But um, from her perspective and, and you know, in terms of survival and living daily life, it was all her doing, um, which was interesting.